Welcome to New Life. We stand and sing with us this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my fingers I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you And then he called my name I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen, it's what he's done, when I was broken, you were my healing, now you're
Pray with me. Father God, we come to you today and we are so thankful for all that you are and for all that you've done for us. God, you are so good and it's not because of us and it's not because anything that we have done to deserve it. But nevertheless, you're still good to us, God. And in today, it's so easy to get bogged down by the negativity and what we see and what we hear every day. Please help us to remember that no matter what, you are still God, you're still sovereign, and you reign, and you are good. We love you, and we thank you for everything you've given us, and we pray all of this in your name. Good morning, New Life Chantilly. Man, can't think of a better way to start a morning, a Sunday morning, with celebrating baptisms, man, and people's changed lives. Hey, if you're someone in this place right now that has questions about baptism, and you're sitting there and God's stirring your heart, I remember that day when it was happening to me, don't leave this place without talking to someone. All right, come to the back, have a conversation, myself or Dale, I'd love to answer those questions, and hey, we're ready today if you are. Shorts and t-shirts are available. Hey, good morning, especially if this is your first time with us. So glad that you decided to join us. Um, those of you that are watching online, we're glad that you're with us too. If you would, say good morning to your chat host. Also, why don't you uh, tell them where you're watching from. And I'd also love to chat with you throughout the service today. It's one of the advantages you have over us here. Those of you who are live, right, hope you got a program when you came in. Um, always like to point out uh, the fact that there is a place in there with counter of upcoming events. It's what I like to say when people go, oh, Mike, I wish I knew about that. And I'm like, well, do you, do you ever pick this up? Because it's all on there, right? All those upcoming things. Um, especially bring your attention uh, to on March the 10th, we have a new class called Discovering the Bible. If you understand um, how to get the most out of your Bible reading and study, I encourage you to show up for that. It's during third service, two weeks from today. Uh, the most important part on this, is, though, is our prayer request area. Um, this is the place where you can share your prayer requests with us, uh, maybe for yourself or someone you may know. So again, just fill this out. You can drop it in the offering bag at the end of services or drop it at the tent. And by the way, if you want someone to pray with you before you leave this place, also meet us in the back in the, in the services. There'll be a, people from our prayer team there too. Lastly, New Life has an app. What I love about this, multitude of things. You can find out about upcoming events. You can fill out your connection card. But again, most important thing is you can upload your prayer request. 24-7, 365, you send those to us. They come to our email, and I love it, because as soon as I open my email, I see your prayer request, and we can pray over those immediately. All right? Awesome. Hey, we start a new sermon series today, um, but before Brett comes up, band's got another song for you. I'm living in a land of death. Burnt and gray, there's a smoldering smoke overhead, and the night looks the same as the day. It seems a miracle that I can stand when everyone I've known drifts up in the air with the ash. Every time that the wind starts to 
But I feel alive with a lie that's not mine. Your law is stream in this waste. Let my life line so much more than precious gold. All your promises, my Lord, by them is your servant. Yeah. 
Well, good morning. Would you show some appreciation to the worship team this morning? That's great. Thank you all. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. As I said, we're beginning a series of messages called uh, Help I'm Drowning, Hope for the Drowning. Uh, if you ever feel like you are drowning in over your head in some area, this series is for you. This morning, for instance, we're beginning with the idea of drowning in anxiety. And uh, it kind of reminds me of a story. <clears throat> Warning. Bad joke ahead. A guy goes to his psychiatrist and says, Doc, I've got a problem. You got to help me. Oh, what's wrong? Well, one day I dream I'm a teepee. The next day I dream I'm a wigwam. One day I dream I'm a teepee. The next day I dream I'm a wigwam. Doc, what's wrong with me? He says, obvious. It's what's wrong with you. You're too tense. Hey, I warned you ahead of time. Here's the question this morning. How are you too tense? tense. Would you write it down or perhaps get out your phone and write down a couple of areas of stress, anxiety in your life that you want to focus on and ask God to help you this morning. According to the New York Times, Americans are the most anxious people on earth. American Psychological Association reports that 24% of Americans say that they are overwhelmed by anxiety. I think the number is probably higher than that at times. Cell phones, deadlines, work stress, 24 hours of bad news on television, broken relationships, frustrated expectations, social media, all make it really difficult for us to go around saying, hey, don't worry, be happy. Time Magazine ran a cover article recently entitled uh, last year, Teenage Anxiety. It was, the title was, the, the Kids Are Not All Right, American Teens Are Anxious, Depressed, and Overwhelmed. It went on to say that our kids today are being raised in a milieu that is perfect for raising, creating an angsty generation. Anxiety seems to be the new norm. Now, maybe you're the rare person in this place. Maybe you're saying, not me, Brett. I'm happy. I'm unfazed. Nothing bothers me. Well, good for you. Okay, I understand there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who get ulcers and those who give ulcers. And maybe you're that second kind of person. You can just take a nap for the next 35 minutes. The rest of us are gonna find some hope in Philippians chapter four, verse six. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul there is almost just echoing what Jesus said in the great, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, don't worry. Three times in Matthew 6, Jesus said, don't worry. Don't worry. Because he wants us to take worry seriously. You don't have to be destroyed by worry. Verse 25 of Matthew 6, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Now, a caveat here. Some people have anxiety that's caused by trauma. Some of us have anxiety that's driven by genes. I swim in that gene pool with you and just like if you have a broken arm, you need to get medical help. If you have chemical stuff going on, get medical help. The Bible's not diminishing that. Some of you need to get counseling. I'm so thankful for Al Nestor, who's helped me through the years in many ways. Um, and, and Al counsels here on, on Tuesdays. And if you're not comfortable going to Al, he'll give you some uh, leads for other good counselors in the area. If you need medical help, get it. If you need counseling help, get it. But what the Bible would say is there's also a spiritual dimension to anxiety. There is, there is responsibility that we can take. And God has something better for you than a life that is choked by anxiety. How can you take responsibility so that God can actually use your worry to give you the life that you dream of, the life that is closer to God, the life that is more mature and more peaceful? That's what we're going to talk about today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we invite you to speak to us. God, I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that is in this place, moving in our souls. 
and, um, and, and would ask that you would lead us now. We would hear you now. Through Christ we pray, amen. Now, when the Bible says don't worry, um, God isn't say, speaking like uh, an angry father pointing out his finger. You know, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. He's more like saying, take worry seriously. I went to the doctor this past week and we were talking about anxiety. And she said, Brett, most people don't take anxiety seriously until it's too late. That's what God's saying. Anxiety will hurt you. Take it seriously now. It can do damage if you're not careful. Anxiety distorts our view of reality. It robs our joy. Every headache is a potential tumor. Every bad sound in the car is a $2,000 repair. I love this cartoon of Anxiety Girl, able to jump to the worst conclusions in a single bound. That's what God's saying. Don't let anxiety control you. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and may have it in abundance. There is one who wants to rob you with anxiety, but God wants to give you life. Four reasons why I think God would tell us not to worry. The first is because worry is futile. It wastes time and energy. In Matthew chapter six, verse 27, Jesus says, can any of you add one moment to his life lifespan by worrying? I believe my grandfather was in his 70s when Dr. Good told him and us that he was on borrowed time, that his heart was on borrowed time. I mean, from that time on, I remember thinking, you know, my grandfather could have a heart attack or a stroke any moment. I remember thinking that through his 70s and through his 80s and until he was 96 years old and he died restfully in his sleep. You know, do you think, I, my, my grandfather needed to take responsibility, he needed to take his medicine, he needed to watch his diet, but do you think anybody's anxiety, worrying about it, actually added a couple of days to his life? No, that's what the Bible says. In fact, according to Nightingale Research, 92% of the things that we worry about have no substance at all. They either don't matter, they never happen, or they can't be changed. It's a waste. Second, worry destroys I love that old line that says, if you are ever tempted to worry, remember a raisin was once a happy grape. Maybe you'll get that later, or maybe it just wasn't that funny. But that's what worry does to us. It sucks us of life. It sucks us of energy. It, it, it sucks out the joy in our relationships. It makes us hard to live with. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you. Thomas Carlyle, there's a story that goes one time, his neighbors, he was frustrated because his neighbors raised chicken. And, and he told his neighbor, your rooster wakes me up every night. And the neighbor was like, he only, he only crows twice a night. Carlyle said, yes, but if you only knew how I suffer waiting for him to crow. Isn't that how it works? We're worried about something, and it's the anticipation of the bad thing that just might happen that causes more anxiety. Anxiety causes us to overthink, to rehearse every offense, to play on the defense, and to choke up, to overanalyze every conversation, to second guess every decision. God says, don't worry, it's destructive. I remember several years ago playing golf with my dad. I think my dad has to be the healthiest 80-some-year-old person on the planet, okay? Um, I remember, uh, just because he doesn't worry, I think part of it was he went through so many difficult things as a kid growing up that he's learned not to sweat small stuff. But we're playing, we're playing golf, and I'm worried about I'm everything. You know, I'm worried about all of the golf balls that I'm losing, and I'm worried about playing fast enough so that we don't slow down the people behind us so they don't get upset with us. And Dad, I think it was about the fifth hole, I remember Dad just kind of stopped me and said, Brett, if you don't learn how to relax, it's going to drive you to an early grave. Now, why did my dad say that? Because he's mean, because he's trying to, you know, be demanding. No, it's because he's a loving father who wants my best. When God says, don't worry, it's not to make you feel guilty and shamed. It's to say, I want what's best for you. I'm a loving heavenly father. Another reason we shouldn't worry is because worry is contagious. 
Have you ever known when somebody worries, everybody can be calm, but somebody worries and they just kind of spray emotional toxins on everybody in the room. Remember that old story of Chicken Little? The sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. She goes around the cart, and co- the, the barnyard, the sky's not falling, but by the time she's done screaming, everybody is upset. Old Testament tells a story like this. God had promised his people the promised land. For centuries, he told them he was gonna give them the promised land. Finally, the time arrived. He told the people, enter the promised land. They send 12 spies. Two come back, Joshua and Caleb, and say, it's beautiful. It's all that God promised. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. With God's power, we can do this. 10 come back. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. It's too big. The people in it are giants. We'll never be able to do it. And because the two or three million people of Israel listened to the majority, listened to the 10, they would perish wandering in the wilderness the next 40 years. You know, we live in a world of chicken littles who are trying to use your fears and anxieties to manipulate you, to get you to watch their news. Breaking news. Oh, I thought, I, I think I heard that three weeks ago. Or ads. People know to sell their products, they have to make you feel uncomfortable or discontent with where you are right now. You gotta buy this right now. Limited time offer. I think the worst are politicians, quite frankly. That's kind of a generally true statement, isn't it? But anyway, no, what do they, they go around and say, you gotta vote for me or else the sky is falling, the sky is falling, you know? It may be, it may cost you more money, it may take more of your freedom, but it's better than dying, you know? I mean, just read history and the people who've done that through history and people, and so you gotta vote for them or else it's gonna be catastrophe. Do you know who is the, do you know how old the fable is, the chicken little fable? 25 centuries. For 25 centuries, every generation has had a group of people screaming, the sky is falling. And gullible people buy it. Don't worry, it's contagious, and don't be the one spreading the contagion. Finally, don't worry because it shows a lack of faith. Uncontrolled worry is like calling God a liar. God's word says, I will be with you always. Worry says, I'm all alone in this universe. God's word says, my, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Worry says, if I don't take care of myself, nobody else will. God's word says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and have been called according to his purpose. Worry says, my situation, my future is hopeless. God's word says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Worry says, I'll never be able to handle it. Oswald Chambers said, unbelief begins when we say, I will not trust what I cannot see. All of our fretting is the result of calculating, I cannot trust God because I can't see God right now. I want for you to think spiritually and not politically right now, okay? Are you fretting about the world ending by climate change? I'm not making a scientific observation, just think about that. Hebrews chapter one tells us this about the world. You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. You are the same, and your years will have no end. See what the Bible says? If the science at some point says the world is wearing out, 
I say, I'm not surprised. The Bible says the world is going to wear out. But who rolls up the garment? Who is in control? There are people going around. We need to take the science seriously, but with the heebie-jeebies of, oh, look at what we're doing to the world. We're going to end the world. Really? All of a sudden, God's not in control. All of a sudden, God's not going to provide for us. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Jesus says, look at the robins. When was the last time you saw an anxious robin? When was the last time you saw a robin fretting? We have an overpopulation of robins in this world. We're going to have a worm shortage. You know, oh no, what's going to happen? But I'll tell you this, if any of you are around for the 70s energy crisis, what happens is there are people who will create a crisis by overreacting and living like we live in a world where God isn't providing and taking care of us. Matthew 6, 28 Observe the wild flowers of the field, how they grow. They don't labor or spin thread. And yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that is how God clothed the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, O you of little faith? And there was no time clock on that promise. You know, God didn't say, until the 21st century, and then it's all out of my control. Don't worry, because anxiety is a refusal to believe that God is God and in control. If anybody had reason to worry, because he was out of control, it was Paul. He is in a, a house, under house arrest, doesn't know what the future holds, and yet he writes to these Philippians, don't worry. One prescription for worry, the first part of it is pray. Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Worry is a spiritual trigger to draw close to God. Like a dashboard light that says, check engine, you know, tire pressure low, baby in the back seat needs a new diaper, whatever, it is, it is a, 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 a light that goes on to us that says, don't be anxious, pray. How do we pray? Pray absolutely. Underline the word, two words, anything and everything. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything. You know what that means? Pray absolutely. That means there's nothing too small for God, nothing too big for God. The next time you think, oh, that's such a small thing, God doesn't care about that, or oh, that's a big thing, if I prayed, it's not gonna make any difference. The first thing this says is pray about everything, big or small, big or small. A second means trust God then in everything, release everything to God. Psalm 20 verse seven, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Now my guess is that you probably don't trust in your chariots too much. Some trust in big bank accounts. Some trust in their big brains. Some trust in their big plans. Some trust in their big government. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Somebody defined worry as assuming responsibility God never intended us to accept. Imagine you promised to take your kids to Disney World. And a couple of days before you go, your oldest comes to you and says, Dad, Disney's a long way from here. Are you sure you're going to have safe housing for us? You're halfway down 95, and your oldest says, Dad, it's a long drive. Are you sure we have enough gas? Dad, I'm really hungry. I'm kind of getting hungry. Are you sure that I'm not going to starve? Dad, Disney's really expensive, and I don't have enough money to be able to afford it. I don't, Dad, are you sure I'm going to be able to afford it? Dad, Disney's a really big place. I'm afraid I'm going to get lost. Dad, what if I get lost? What would you say to a child that did that? You say, hey, I promised you Disney. I love you. I'm going to take care of the rest. Oh, God, I'm worried about all this stuff. God says, I provided for you salvation. I provided for you my son, Jesus Christ. Eternity. I'll provide for you. 
the rest, what you need. Matthew, 20, Matthew 6, verse 31. She said, therefore, don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. See, the contrast here is with the Gentiles. That's another way of saying pagans. People who don't believe they have a heavenly father. They believe they're living in a closed universe. Their gods are small. They have reason to worry because they feel like they are orphans in this world. See, this is the reason why there's so, one reason where it's so much anxiety in our nation because we live in a secular time in a secular culture where people believe that we are here by accident. The world is an accident and, and there is no God who looks out for us. There is no God in control. The only ones that we can help is ourselves. Well, you don't have to lack confidence because you have a loving heavenly father. You know what I think is interesting? Amazon knows everything about you and me. You know, have you discovered that to be true? Some of you know that already. Um, but, but Amazon, according to Amazon, you know what the most highlighted passage in the Bible is? It's this one we're reading today. Verse six, don't worry, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We all need it, don't we? Pray about everything, release everything. But pray with thanksgiving, he says. By, um, in other words, when you find yourself feeling anxious, you have a choice, you can worry or you can choose to celebrate. Nothing counters anxiety quite like a grateful spirit. When I was a kid growing up, we used to sing a song in church, count your many blessings. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you're discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. That is a great exercise. The next time you were anxious, you're driving down the road worrying about some meeting coming up or some confrontation. What if you would stop and rather focus on your anxiety, focus on God and be, th count your many blessings. Go through the, the alphabet if, you, if that's helpful. God, I thank you for A. I thank you for apples and for the Andrews family. I, B, I thank you for the Bible and for baseball. Not necessarily in that order sometimes. But C, I thank you for coffee and I thank you for cat. To Morans. Uh, D, I thank you for dogs. I thank you for my dad. You just go through the alphabet and it will surprise you. God has been so good to me. Maybe I can trust him with this. You want to take it a step deeper? Learn to thank God in the things you don't like. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, in everything give thanks. You want to overcome anxiety when you are hurt, when you are anxious, you give thanks to God for that difficult thing. I'll never forget when my oldest was playing SYA baseball, and this was back in the day that I was just assistant coaching. There was only one coach that I did not want to pick, Zachary, Randy Medina. Some of you know Randy Medina. I've told Randy this story a hundred times. I love Randy Medina now. But I just remember thinking, I'm praying, Lord, I don't care who picks him, just not Randy. I'd coached against Randy. It's kind of like, oh, I, I'm not going to get along with Randy Medina. And, um, and so we got the telephone call. Guess who picked Zachary? Randy Medina. And so, uh, like I said, but you know what? I look back on that. That was one of my favorite seasons of all. Not only did Randy and I become good friends, and um, I mean, even afterward, 10 years afterward, 15 years afterward, we would do things together, went to Caps game together, um, and talked together. By the way, if, I, I don't know, he's moved away. I think it's Smith Mountain Lake or something like that. If anybody knows where he is, I'd love to get in touch with him again. But at any rate, not only did I become a good friend with Randy, and, just, and it was like, okay, God, thank you. But you know who the other assistant coach was on that team? Mike Pickering. Mike Pickering's a leader here at New Life. Um, uh, uh, he is a leader in Celebrate Recovery. Every time I see Mike, and we talk about this all the time, but every time I see Mike, I just think, I say, God, I thank you that you didn't answer my prayer, that you had Randy pick Zachary. You know who else was on that team? Tyler Wilson. 
Tyler was, did an internship with us, continues to, to come. Um, his parents, Mark and Sandy, became dear friends of ours. You know who else was on that team? Um, Jaden Spencer. Michelle, Jaden's mom, taught in Kid Zone for years. You know who was, was on that team? Alex Harris. Alex comes, many of you know Alex. Um, uh, Colleen and David have been you know, friends ever since that. In fact, it was the, the closing team party that we first talked about New Life and they started to come. But um, uh, Colleen has been on staff at New Life. She's been on staff at the End Zone ever since the very beginning. In fact, if you wanna know the dirty little secret about the End Zone, if I walk away, it's not gonna matter. If Colleen ever walks away, we're gonna shut the doors. Because she, I mean, um, you think I'm kidding, but people are like, oh man, she's at the middle of all this. I can't imagine new life without Dave and Colleen Harris. You know, I was like, oh God, why did you do that? And then I remember, I do remember praying, okay, God, that's a funny joke that you had Randy pick Zachary, but I'm going to trust that you're up to something. Can you be thankful when you're disappointed? Can you be thankful in what you see is difficult? Said the robin to the sparrow, I should surely like to know why those anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Finally, Paul gives us a promise for peace, verse seven. And the peace of God, if you have your Bibles open, underline those three words, peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that transcends human reason will stand like a garrison soldiering your soul. The question is, the promise is the peace of God. The question is, what are you looking for? The peace of God or the peace of the world? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. What kind of peace are you looking for? There's some people that this is the kind of peace that they're looking for. Everybody holding hands, everybody living in unity. We're all a wonderful community. If that's your idea of peace, you're always gonna be anxious because we are fallen people living in a fallen world and you will always have human conflict. You'll never be at peace. It'll always elude you. Some people, their idea of peace is that lake. I, I love that idea of peace, you know? Just nice and calm. But I've lived on a lake long enough to know that's a peace that doesn't last. Lived long enough to know even in that setting, there are things to worry about. There are bills to pay. There are people that get sick. If that's your idea of peace, it'll always elude you because it'll be like a vapor. You know what a biblical view of peace, when God talks about his peace, it's more like this picture. This is the picture that was in my brother's room and mine at our grandparents' house, cottage at the lake when we were kids. I love that picture. Think about it often. See the dark clouds in the background? See the storm on the waters? See the waves crashing over the rails? If you've ever been on a sailboat in the middle of a storm, it is terrifying. It's terrifying. You wonder if you're gonna get hit by lightning and just go down there. Now look at the sailor's strong face. Look at his calm. Look at the courage in his eyes. Why? It's not because everything is peaceful around him. It's not because everybody's singing kumbaya. It's because Jesus is his pilot. Notice, by the way, who's holding the wheel. I love that. The sailor's taken his responsibility. He's taken responsibility for what God has given him, but he has a peace of knowing that Jesus is present, that Jesus is guiding, that Jesus is ultimately protecting and ultimately in control. My peace I give you, Jesus said. See, the Bible doesn't promise that your life is gonna be easier. It doesn't say he'll guard your body. He'll keep you away from troubles. The Apostle Paul would eventually be falsely accused by Nero and beheaded. That was 
not fair, unjust. See, we still live in a world where people will get sick, where children break bones, where friends get cancer, where cars wreck, where we all die. The difference is knowing Jesus is with us through the storm and he is greater than the storm. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. But not as the world gives you do I give you. See, the Bible says, the world says peace comes from a stress-free world. Peace comes when life is easy, when you have enough wealth, when you can create enough safe spaces for yourself. Jesus says, peace comes from knowing you are mine and I am yours. In an article in The Atlantic, Scott Stossel openly shared about his anxious experiences from the time he was young. He said he was a twitching bundle of phobias, fears, and neuroses. He said even when he was not actively afflicted by acute episodes of anxiety, he said, I was buffeted by fear. Here's what I tried to do to overcome anxiety. And he listed, listed 19 different types of therapy, including yoga and audio tapes. And medications, lots of them. He lists 34 medications, including beer, wine, gin, bourbon, vodka, and scotch. <laughs> Went through the litany, didn't he? And then he said, here's what worked. Nothing. Now, I am not saying that counseling and medication aren't helpful. They have helped me. I'm saying they are weak. They are limited. They cannot calm the soul. But Jesus' presence, the Holy Spirit's power with counseling, sometimes with medication, is powerful. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives. Is the reason that peace eludes you because you're looking for it like the world gives. Let me be real practical as we end. So the first part, the first practical step is he says, pray, pray in everything, pray with thanksgiving, look for Jesus' peace. Now here's, here's the final step, trust God in everything. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, the Bible says. Trust him by praying in everything. We already talked about that. Trust him in his promises. When I'm anxious, nothing calms me by le like leaning on God's voice and hearing his voice and his promises. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Proverbs 3, 24, if you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence. Where's your confidence? In the Lord or something else? In Matthew 28, Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Colossians 3, 15, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. That's what you were called for. See, all of these scriptures say one thing, anxiety suffocates in the atmosphere of God's presence. So read the Bible, claim his promises, believe them. Finally, I'd say trust God in daily surrender. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you as well. I would put it like this. It's almost like Jesus saying, are you gonna play defense or are you gonna play offense? Sometimes we need to play defense, but that's all the world has. The world will say, you need to play defense. You know, make sure you are not doing too much. Make sure you eliminate all the, a lot of activities from your life. Make sure you eliminate your responsibilities. Make sure, you, well, how do you do that when you're a mom of three little kids under age six? Oh, I got to eliminate my responsibilities. I think I'll sell my kids. No, that's not going to work. I, my doctor said to me this past week, she said, I think that you need to 
to, to, to eliminate some things from your life. You're just too stressed. And I just like smiled and thought, well, that's not gonna happen because I, I love the things that I'm responsible for. I'm called to do the things that I'm responsible for. And if I don't do the things that I'm responsible for, it'll just make Pat Ferguson more stressed, and, which isn't fair either, right? So what do you do? The world's just always saying, play offense, play defense, play defense. Jesus, play offense, Follow God's calling on your life and then trust that God's gonna provide for you what you need. Americans have a hard time with this. This is a different concept, I'm guessing, for many of us here this morning. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 14, verse eight. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live for the Lord or whether we die, we're the Lord's. Say, oh, that sounds like a nice metaphor. Here's what I mean. A good example of that in my life is Bill Smith. Some of you know Bill Smith, 74-year-old missionary, still is making disciples all around the world. He's still going to places where he says, pray for me. I know they have diseases there that'll kill me. Um, He goes to places where he could get kidnapped, held for ransom, and killed. He goes to places where it's not legal for Christians to go and to share Jesus, and he goes anyway. He could get arrested in those places. He goes to places where he flies on planes that people from the West don't fly on because they're known to break down so much. I say, Bill, you're 74 years old. Aren't you, I mean, don't you want to like relax? Don't you want a, a safer life? And Bill says, Brett, God called me to be a missionary. This is what God has made me to be and to do. I will obey him and I will trust him. Bill has great peace knowing he could die on his next trip. Why? Because he has said, Romans chapter 14, for to live, we live to God. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we die for the Lord. Do you know why so many people are not at peace? We live in a secular culture. We pride ourselves on being a secular culture. But as soon as you're a secular culture, what is it? It's my life, my priorities, my money, my body, my time, me, 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 me. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in anxious and we're like, okay, God, save me. Okay, God, I want you to help me in this part of my life. You're always, it doesn't work that way. You want to have peace. It begins like this. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. It's not my life. It's your life, Lord. It's your body. It's your priorities. It's your money. It's your career. It's your purpose. It's your college. Lord, I just want to live for you. So whether I live or whether I die, I live or die to the Lord. And therefore, I have peace. Why? Because I'm not playing in fear. I'm playing offense. And I know I'm in God's hands because everything has been surrendered to his hands. So when I call you out to say, surrender your life to Jesus Christ completely, your time, your money, your body, your decisions, your morality, your priority, I'm not saying that to be some kind of, you know, manipulate you to do something that I want you to do religiously. It's because it's what you made for and ultimately it's the only way you will have Peace, it's the only way we get the peace that Jesus gives because he is Lord of all. And that's why if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the place to begin is right there. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, Um, I confess that I have a lot of anxiety because I'm still trying to be the king in control of a lot in my life. And I really worry because I'm really not convinced that you are in control of all because I'm trying to play this game where mine, 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 mine. Oh yeah, Lord, now you help me over here. Help So Lord, I I thank you that you're patient and you're gracious. Help each of us take whatever next step you have for us, not out of a sense of legalism, not out of a sense of buying you off with our obedience, but simply because we wanna walk with you as we are made to walk with you. 
We want to know you completely. We want to live for you holy. And I thank you the result of that is your peace that the world will never be able to understand. Through Christ we pray these things. Amen. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, true peace, true victory over anxiety is not merely found in a medical solution or a psychological solution. It needs a spiritual solution. Peace with God. The first step for you is to surrender to Jesus Christ. Forgive my sins, Lord, and I surrender all to you. I want to walk with you in every way. As I said, not to buy him off, not to please him like some father who, you know, is going to be angry, but just because you want to walk with him. For those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, we all struggle with this, at least I know I do. And so we take of communion today. And I ask you as you hold on to the Kraken cup, remember that Jesus gave his life for you. Somebody said, um, the reason that we lack peace is because, is because we don't fully love God. I would say part of the reason we don't have peace is because we're not fully convinced how much God loves us. That one of the things we need is not to try to white knuckle trust in God, but we just need to appreciate how much he loves us. Therefore, we can trust him. How do you know how much he loves you? Hold on to the cracker and cup. He gave his only son for your forgiveness. He gave his only son so you could have eternal life in relationship with him. Now would you experience his love and take that next step with him this morning? In this quiet time, whatever God is calling you to do, respond, answer, and then I'll wrap us up with a time of prayer. Let's share right now, please. Pray together, please. And if you're ready to take communion, you can do so now. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you speak to us. 
I thank you for what you are doing right now in each person. Lord, we will reach out to you and grab your hand and ask you to help us take that next step. For those who are coming in here overwhelmed with anxiety, Lord, enter them that they may find your peace in the midst of the storm. For those of us who are who are wrestling um, because we're trying to have it both ways. We want to be king and we want you to be king and we want to be king even more. And, um, we confess, Lord, that that's a ba- battle and we can't even win it without you. So thanks for your grace, but Lord, we want to trust you more. And we have friends who need peace who aren't here this morning Would you give us opportunities this week to share something about Jesus and his peace with them this week? Because through Christ we pray these things. Amen. So there are people in the back who would love to talk with you. If you you want to pray about anything, if you want us to pray about anything for you, if you have a next step to take with baptism, we would encourage you to do that as well. We're going to take the offering, and I'll be honest with you, it's one of those mixed emotions times for me. I hate the offering time because it occurs to me, you know, the Bible says that uh, the root, the, the, the love of money is the root of all evil, and I realize I got a lot of evil in me. I have bad motives in me, and I never want that to come across. I think Satan would use that sometimes because Jesus also said, where our money goes, our heart goes. And like we said today, part of the, you want to have peace with your money, finances, you put God first with your finances. You obey God with your finances. And so that's what the offering time is about. It's about worshiping God, but it's also about developing a trusting heart, saying, God, you've given it all to me. I trust my life to you, and I trust as I trust you with my finances. And that is really a hard thing to do. But would you do that today? And if you're new here and you just think, I'm not quite sure if this guy is primarily motivated by his love of money, I I completely understand. Let the offering bag pass and develop some trust and do what God leads or give to a different church. But, um, but, But give, trust in God with your finances. That's what we would desire as we worship today. And as we do, Pat Ferguson has a couple of announcements to share with us this morning. Um, I've got a couple quick things and uh, then another thing. Um, First off, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, spending your morning with us here. Um, If you're new, um, we would love to get to know you a little bit. There's a banner in the back that says Take 5. We'd love to meet you just for five minutes, share just a little bit about who New Life is. Um, Second, um, if you've been wrestling with baptism, if you've been uh, trying to decide is is this a time to give your life to Christ and submit everything fully to him, um, we've also got people back there at the baptism banner. We had two people baptized after first service. Um, We would love to see you take that step as well. Um, Talk to someone. Don't leave here. Um, Third, uh, this is a great sermon series. I'm really looking forward to uh, what Brett, um, really what God has in store for us um, over the next three weeks. Um, If you felt like today's message was something that a friend of yours, a family member of yours could really use, please invite them to come back. Um, Invite them to watch this message with you online. Um, It'll be on our YouTube channel tonight. It'll be on our Vimeo channel uh, in a day or two. Um, But uh, share this uh, with people that you know who can use it. Um, Finally, I'm going to ask Mike to come out on stage. Um, This is kind of a bittersweet week for us um, because this is Mike's last Sunday uh, here at New Life with us. Um, His wife has already moved down to Miami, uh, Maria. Her new job's going very, very well. She's looking for a place to stay. Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the sad part that we're going to miss them terribly. Um, but we're also excited about what God has next for them. As we've uh, talked about uh, what God's been doing in their life, we just look forward to seeing the ministry that they're going to be able to have down there and the countless lives they're going to be able to impact. Um, before uh, I share anything else, uh, we've got a video from a guy who used to come to New Life here. He's now uh, starting a CR program and ultimately a church up on the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Let's uh, take a look at Matt. Mike, 
Mike, hey brother, congrats on the new adventure. Uh, I'm excited for you and what God brings in your life. Thanks for having my back for, oh, about 10 years. Uh, I'd like to say to the audience, you know, Mike and I are living proof that God can use punks to do anything. So, so you know, guys don't have any excuses. Love you guys. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask um, if, when we were, uh, had the baptism video in the middle of the service, I noticed how many people uh, Mike baptized. If he baptized you, um, would you stand up? Um, if he was part of your baptism journey, part of your story coming to Christ, would you stand up? <laughs> and if, if he has just impacted your life, um, if he has um, been used by God to make a difference in your life, stand up. Thank you, each and every one of you here. Um, and I've said a lot in the past couple of weeks. Um, the message that, um, that I really want you all to hear is that, you know, all of you standing, there are so many of you in here that what has occurred, God has used me in any way over these past 10 years, would never have been possible without you all having my back, without you supporting me, whether or not we were arm in arm, or I just know you were praying. <laughs> For what was going on. Thanks. 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 Ah. <laughs> Thanks. Would you stand and we're going to close with prayer. And I want you to think of what you're thankful for for Mike and I want you to think of a prayer of blessing that you would like to pray for Mike and Maria. And, and you know, if you just want to place that forward as we pray, place that um, to God as we pray together right now. Lord, there's something holy in this moment for us that we thank you for allowing us to be a part. Knowing the journey that you have led Mike and Maria on and where they were before somebody at New Life shared Jesus with them and how you have walked with them every step of the way and provided for them um, other mentors and leaders and people who've discipled them and that you've allowed us to be a family, to love each other and to grow with each other and to hear you and to f know your love because of our relationships. Um, God, we can't imagine um, new life without Mike and Maria and yet we know that you have called them to this and so we thank you for what years we have had and we trust you for the years ahead as we walk with you. So we ask your blessing on Mike and Maria that you would provide for them abundantly as they have blessed us. Would you bless them with people who will be their family in South Florida? Would you bless them with a church and with ministry of even greater impact than they can have here? We trust, Lord, that that's why you're calling them there. There's more for them that you have to do with them than they could do there than here. Um, I, help us, Lord, to know how to continue to be their family in a distance. May they um, always know our presence and our love. Um, and Lord, there's so much more to pray, but we just need to stop and say thank you and help. We love you, Lord. It's through Christ we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs>